So today's, today's speaker uh, happens to be a brand new board, board member to uh, the Berkshire Center Real Estate Advisory Board, so we're very happy to have him up uh, getting involved with the program right away. Uh, Mr. Steve Hagenbuckle is the speaker today. He's the president and founder of TerraCap Management Corporation out of Benita Springs. It's a private equity firm, real estate firm. They have two private uh, equity real estate funds right now, correct? You're on the second fund. And the University of Florida Foundation happens to be an investor in his second fund. So um, we, we care about having alumni back. He is alumni of the program. And having him investing in our foundation's funds is even, uh, even better. So we get to hear how he's investing in those funds and, and what things he's looking at in the real estate market. So with uh, no further ado, Steve. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always nice to come back to Gainesville. I um, have very, very fond memories uh, of this town. Um, so I'm always looking for an excuse. So if anyone wants to give up tickets to basketball or football, let me know. Um, what we'd like to cover today I thought would be interesting, and of course, you know, a lot of this is for you. So if you guys want to redirect part, part of the way through, we certainly can, can redirect. Um, it may be beneficial to hold questions towards the end because there is a fair amount of material. Um, there's no question that in the last uh, four to five years, there's been a lot of uh, distress and disruption in what would be considered normal real estate markets. There's a lot of dislocation and inefficiencies uh, that clearly present opportunity, um, depending certainly on which side of the trade you're on. But what we're going to start out with today is, uh, as Tim mentioned, um, I manage a couple of private equity funds. And uh, prior, to, prior to doing that, um, I was a founder of a company called Techware Consulting that I founded in 1995 um, during the tech boom. And um, my actual degree was in computer science, but now I focus solely on real estate investing and fund management. Um, but we started this company in 95, and then by 97, we had 155 employees, and we were acquired by a public company called Cyber, CBR. They trade on the New York Stock Exchange. As a result of that liquidity event, I took my portion of the proceeds, and I did two things. I started investing in real estate in 95-96 um, in predominantly southwest Florida, which would be Sarasota, south to Naples, Marco Island area. And the other thing I did was I co-founded a bank in Fort Lauderdale called Landmark Bank. Uh, and we also have an internet banking division of that bank called GiantBank.com. So I sat on the board of that bank from 1999 up until recently, maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, when I resigned. And during that period of time, uh, the real estate market as a result of the credit crisis started going through a, a lot of turbulence and started unwinding and there was significant deleveraging uh, which um, in 2007 and 2008 as a board member I started seeing the regulatory pressures that were going to be put on community banks um, and how they were going to forcefully uh, make the banks deal with these defaulting uh, parties or borrowers. So we saw an opportunity um, which is rare uh, and uh, had a lot of similarity or from, you know, looked very familiar to what occurred in the early 90s with the SNL crisis that created a lot of opportunity for a lot of real estate investors. So um, our opinion at that time was to understand from an entrepreneurial uh, an opportunistic investing perspective, understand where the opportunities were going to be as a result of the dislocations and inefficiencies between banking and real estate, and put together a thesis and ultimately a strategy which would become a private equity fund to be an early participant in buying our way out of the recovery um, without any holdings. We had no holdings at the time. We had no legacy assets. We were starting from fresh and uh, from, you know, starting from scratch, a brand new private equity fund. Uh, so um, I had been, at this point, 
an active real estate investor personally uh, for uh, two real estate cycles. And there were a couple of things I learned during those cycles um, that I'll talk about here in the presentation. Um, and so as I put together the strategy, the one piece that I had never done was I'd never gone to the outside world other than friends and family and small circles and small real estate club deals for investment groups or pools of capital to buy specific assets and then improve upon them, uh, whether, like I said, whether they were hotels or residential development sites that we put an infrastructure in and put up a couple models, sell the balance of the community to uh, uh, builders, national or regional, um, office buildings, things of that nature. I had experience with all those different types of transactions and had a, a banking understanding, but never went out to the public markets to raise capital. But because the opportunity seemed that it would be so great, we, I tried to become a quick study in that area. Spent a lot of time in New York uh, with SEC attorneys and other types of fund management groups. Um, also spent a fair amount of time with some larger uh, banks that were dealing with a lot of defaults. Um, also uh, went around and interviewed uh, other banks that I had relationships with that would ultimately have assets that we would be interested in if and when they became available as a result of default or deleveraging. Um, so all of that front work and research occurred the tail end of 2007 and 2008. Um, and we launched our first fund. Uh, what I'd like to try to do, if it's OK with you guys, is roll some, uh, this is a medley of video clips, because our research at that time was well ahead of the research of even big organizations, such as uh, Goldman Sachs or uh, Starwood or some others that are active participants but had not invested the same amount of time in research um, as to what the opportunities would be in 08 and 09 and 010. So as a result of that, the networks um, that became aware of our research started inviting us on uh, to the shows, whether it was Bloomberg or Fox Business or CNBC. So I'd like to roll some clips going back from 2009 through uh, today, modern day, uh, and it'll help shape what we lived through over the last four and a half to five years and some of uh, our comments about what we anticipated was going to happen. And then in a lot of cases, you'll, you already know what happened, and you can determine for yourself whether you feel this research was, um, was accurate. And then we'll go into the uh, presentation after that. Steve, you run a private equity fund and are excited about the opportunities here. TerraCap Partners is a distressed, opportunistic private equity real estate fund. What's the story right now in residential real estate? Is this the time? What we're seeing now is historic opportunities that we haven't seen since the savings and loan crisis back in the early 90s. I think it's more affordable right now to own versus rent, and I don't think these opportunities are going to last long. When you, well, when you take a house that was $300,000, you can buy it for $200,000, you saved $100,000. That's more attractive than an $8,000 credit. For all-time low production, uh, one-third of the normal required production to support our population growth. In 2011 and 2012, uh, we're going to see a, a, a dramatic spike in new construction. The month-over-month -month stuff doesn't mean that much to me as an investor. What means a lot to me is, is where's the appreciation upride potential, and then it becomes an issue of timing that cycle, buying and selling during the up cycle, and then what area has retained the most. Florida will take twofold any other domestic migration inflows, next closest to Texas, then Arizona. Now, within Florida, as we know, the growth coast is Tampa south to uh, Naples, where TerraCap has, has an office. I feel that in the state of Florida alone, we're looking at probably 25 banks that will fail in the next year to year and a half. A lot of them are trying to offset earnings by investing in mortgage-backed securities, and we all know what happened there. 
These community banks are living off of their past profits. They need to move more money from their past profits into their loan loss reserves for those exposed assets. Did you notice the same tie? I have more than three. Take the write downs, and in some cases, it could be sold at as low as 18, 20 cents on the dollar, as TerraCap has bought in the past. Various investment strategies are being validated. The timing is being validated. It's a very good time to broaden your investment portfolio and take a serious look at real, tangible assets in areas that are attractive and that have also reached really good affordability. But in private equity the opportunities, I would say, are much greater, especially if you look at a certain swath of the market between two and $20 million. On our first fund, we focused on residential. We felt the right time to buy residential was between 2009 and 2011. We focus on the secondary markets because the big players are bidding up all the prices in the primary markets. Other places, places like Tampa, Orlando, the Fort Myers area, Miami, all of them are beginning to rebound, but there's still a lot of assets owned by banks that can be had for very low prices. We bought it at $41 a square foot or $41,000 a unit. Previous highs were selling at $220,000 a unit. Wow. My goodness. It's a nice holiday gift for our, for our share cap <laughs> investors. Okay. So that was the, the formation of the ride that um, occurred over the last four or five years. And um, research was really a key part to being uh, positioned, most importantly from a timing perspective. Um, let me see here. So there's a couple of things that, that uh, I'm going to talk about um, before I get into the presentation that are key to um, positioning yourself safely in today's real estate investing environment um, as safely as possible. And these types of opportunities don't come around often, as I mentioned earlier. But we really focus on five key factors. And if they are all in alignment, then things become very compelling. So the first would be sustained population growth, which we're going to talk about that um, in depth today. And I'll give you a snapshot of some of our research in one particular region. Uh, then limited supply, um, areas where there's uh, land constraints or preservation land. It's very important, helps to limit supply. Low basis, low cost of, of entry. Uh, Hopefully, if you can buy things in today's market between 30 to 50% of replacement cost, that's very compelling. It doesn't happen often, uh, and it's happening more in secondary and tertiary markets as opposed to primary markets, as I suggested earlier. Uh, in the video clip, a lot of the larger players, uh, they tend to be forced to participate in the larger markets because they have to put a lot of money to work. And the larger markets, primary markets like New York, uh, Chicago, DC, San Francisco, um, have larger buildings that trade at higher numbers, north of $20 million. The big funds that I mentioned uh, cannot invest or get their investment committee together um, for investments typically that are smaller than $20 million. At least that was what was transpiring over the last two to three years of buying until they realize that they've bid each other up to replacement cost or higher in primary markets and now are uh, forced to take a look at secondary markets and reduce their minimum investments um, in order to participate. And the real spread opportunities are in the smaller uh, markets where you can buy at better discounts. Um, also, it's important that there are sellers under pressure. That's pretty common right now whether it's a, a bank that's foreclosing on a property or has already taken the property back or is part of a FDIC law sharing agreement uh, where they are the good bank that absorbed the bad bank's assets but have a, a timeline uh, in place, usually five years before the backstop of the federal government uh, remains intact. 
And then the other area is focus on areas where there's limited buyers. Um, so for us, we try to target acquisitions that are between $2 million and $20 million. And the reason we focus on that is because it's too small for the big large funds like Blackstone, Carlisle, Lone Star, but too big for a lot of local investors who want to buy distressed assets and maybe can get together some country club money or their own money up to a couple few million dollars. But if the asset, let's say, is seven to $10 million and they need debt, but the property isn't stabilized and has a high, uh, or a, uh, high vacancy rate, um, low occupancy rate, then they can't get lending. So that's why we focus in that target market for as, as long as we can. So those are, those are five important things. And what they do is they position you uh, at, for a defensive capital structure, uh, which you know, limits risk. Um, I'm going to now get into the uh, presentation. And um, we will uh, talk about that. Well, I guess I went over all those things um, right here. So uh, regional focus is important for many region reasons. But if you look at these uh, states here that are in blue and green, there's been a funnel effect or a, a migratory trend towards this region. This region is categorized by the United States Census Bureau as the South region. But as you can see, it feels more southeasterly, but it includes Texas. So Texas to Florida, up to Washington, DC. There's been a, a, a major migratory movement over the last 20 to 40 years in that region. It's currently home to 37% of the total US population, which is about 118 million people currently. And population, at the end of the day, is the underlying driver for demand for all real estate. Residential usually leads commercial. So you need the rooftops, the people come there, then you need the services. And to follow the services, whether they're hospitals, schools, shopping, it follows the rooftops. Same holds true when you're investing. If there's a collapse in residential, commercial usually follows it or lags. So that was an important part of, of our thesis. Our first fund was focused on residential development sites in areas of high demand land constraints, limited supply, where builders were overstocked on quality land, but when their end unit sales of homes slowed down, they didn't have the income to service the debt on the non-income producing properties or land. So they had to give a lot of that land back to the banks. For example, Lennar, a big home builder, at one point had 281 parcels of land around the United States held either through land banking relationships directly um, or um, in, in some other capacity. Uh, and when they pared that down, they ended up holding only 90 parcels when they were getting pressure from their shareholders. So population is very important, um, not only short term, but long term you know, for the value of any asset. So, the other thing that region shows is that 50% of new housing starts in the US are in that south region. So that means, in some cases, it reaches, depending on the quarter uh, or the month, as high as 58% uh, of new housing starts happen in that region. So that's where the new development is. That's where a lot of people are going more consistently than other uh, parts of the country. And we can get into all the different reasons why, uh, but a lot of it these days is you know quality of life, lower taxation, um, retirement, you know uh, all those things. That beautiful weather like today uh, helps. Another key uh, piece to focus on is international home buying, because even though in a lot of cases they're secondary homes, those homes are trading. There's ownership, and then you know part time, uh, um, part time residency. But regardless, it takes that property off the market. Um, so if you look at international home buying, if you look at the, the uh, column to the left, you could see that Florida represents 6% of the total US population. California represents twice that, 12% the US population. But if you look at the international home buying, on average, over the last 10 years, Florida has taken every year 26% of all international home buying that occurs in the United States. The next closest state is California at 11%. Florida reached as high 
as 31% of all international home buying. Part of that has been influenced by the bubbling that's starting to happen in some of the Latin American emerging markets. So, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, these markets that have done well financially have all seen great appreciation during uh, the last four or five years, uh, especially in real estate. And so now people are taking profits and looking for other places to put those profits. So when Florida became extremely affordable, it pulled even more of those buyers forward. Also, people from an international perspective like Florida because rather than, let's say, the Caribbean, and the reason for that is because of political stability or you know, limited to no political risk, and also your rights have, you have rights with real estate ownership here in Florida that can be protected. Also, proximity for travel is very important. For example, most of the California international home buying comes from uh, Asian markets or from Mexico. Um, Florida, for example, is close to Europe and Latin America. So 54% of all Germans, when they buy a home in the United States, they buy it in Florida. 47% of all the Brits, when they buy a home in the US, they buy in Florida. 45% of Latins, when they buy a home in the US, they buy in Florida. And 33% of the Canadians, when they buy a home in the US, they buy in Florida. So it's pretty compelling, and as we keep going, down this path, you're going to start seeing the thesis for our focus and our funds and why you know, some of this at the time may not have seemed that important or may have been early thought for these networks and others that were maybe challenging our thought process. But now that we're selling the assets that we bought from the first fund and outperforming with our assets in the second fund, it's all becoming crystal clear. But it was really just numbers and research working the numbers against normal production and absorption and figuring out where the opportunities were. So let's look at domestic migration, which I touched on earlier. This is over uh, an 11-year period of time. You can see Florida took in a positive 1.3 million people from other states. The next closest was Texas at 900,000 people and change. Arizona was next closest at 721,000. And as you can see from a domestic migration perspective, New York and California lost population. New York loses about 180 to 200,000 people per year to domestic migration outflows, positioning Florida to be the third largest state in the union in the, within the next two to three years. So right now we're about a million uh, a little less than a million people apart, and um, that won't take long for Florida to outpace that. Florida took in, uh, for example, last year alone, 100,000 people from New York, uh, or I'm sorry, 60,000 people from New York and 40,000 people from Georgia. So 100,000 people combined just from two states came into Florida. Um, if it wasn't for international home buying, and the Asian influx into California, California would show a negative uh, population um, pattern where it's still positive, but these are just domestic migration. So if we look at 40 years of population growth, compounded annual growth from 1970 to 2011, so this is you know not a short-term thing, this is a long-term consistent pattern, the US population growth is averaged 1.05% over that period of time, 40 years. Texas has averaged about twice the US population growth over that same period of time. Florida, about two and a half times the US population growth. And parts of Florida, as high as fold the US population growth. So now you're, you're starting to see you know, the potential uh, and a pattern here where you're, these numbers start making sense and you're going, well, what do we have here? This is, this is maybe an opportunity that's developing. And then you want to understand, as a real estate investor, you know where the hot spot is, and we're going to even drill down on that a little bit more. But then you have available to you from the IRS address changes that they make public where people move from if they change their address. So you can see within a state what counties are becoming more popular than other counties. In this particular representation, 
we know that two and a half times as many people are moving from southeast Florida to the west coast of Florida than the other way around. So for every 25 that move west, only 10 move east. Now here's where it really starts to get interesting. Those graphics are to scale. So Florida, as you can see, if you look at the uh, third line down in area and square miles, Florida is about one-fifth the size of Texas, one-third the size of California, one-half the size geographically of Nevada and Arizona. Yet remember, it's only 6% of the U.S. population. But look at the population per square mile in Florida. Florida has 355 people per square mile. And the next closest is California at 241. So we've got a smaller space, right, with significantly more people coming into this smaller space through domestic migration inflow and international home buying by far than any other competing state or popular state. And these, I would profess to be the most popular states with activity and interest. A lot of people call them the sand states, and a lot of it has to do with lifestyle and temperature and sun and, and those types of things. So when we were going through our research, now things start jumping off the page. And if you dig even deeper, which we won't get into, and you start looking at things like preservation land, uh, land constraints. For example, Florida, most people want to live along the coastline, close to the beaches. So the population tends to get compressed in those areas. So you may be more compelled to invest in those areas. Now, where the opportunity really gets exciting is if you look at all of those states and you look at the sustained growth in some of the states, the one that had the most sustained growth and the most domestic migration inflows and the most appeal uh, also had the biggest distress in pricing and some of the biggest downward price pressure on record of all. So now you've got your thesis, right? So now it becomes an, an issue of, of knowing the areas that you're going to target, whether it's the land use or the demand for housing, offices, um, where the future uh, roads are going to be expanded, where intersections are going to be improved upon, uh, where schools are going, so on and so forth. This is the population projections from information from multiple sources. UF is one. Another one is UCF. Another one is the Census Bureau. And surprisingly enough, we went back and looked back to predictions from old newspaper articles from the US Census Bureau from back in the 70s, trying to project the population of Florida 20 to 30 years ahead of time. And they were surprisingly, very surprisingly accurate, like within 500,000 people, OK? going that far back. So we take a blend of all those different sources, and we look at the different regions. And as you could see, as I mentioned earlier, the hotter spots would be the southwest, central Florida. Um, the southeast tends to be overbuilt. There's not a lot of land left. You know, The southeast and southwest both press up upon the um, Everglades. And by way of example, I was talking about land constraints and, and where opportunity is. Uh, for example, Collier County, which is home to Naples, is 67% preservation land. The entire county, if you look at it, it's 67% preservation land. So if you put all this information together, you start getting laser focus on where you should be investing. And then if you can buy things at 25 to 30% up to 50% of replacement cost, it's a pretty defensive position as a fund manager um, to take a look at. So one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, that I'll just talk a little bit about, and I, I said this on Bloomberg when they were trying to make a big deal about the Case-Shiller movement on a monthly basis of, of home values. It's much broader than that. It's much deeper than that. And that, that was the point I was trying to make where I said, I'm more interested in the appreciation upride potential 
and then buying and selling during that up cycle. So if you look at areas like, for example, Miami, Miami went up. Blue represents the peak appreciation from 2000 to the peak, and this is residential. So from a residential perspective, the average home went up 180% in value between 2000 and summer of 2006 in six years. After the complete give back up to August of last year, it still retained 48% of that appreciation. So the media would let you to believe that Miami was completely devastated and all value was lost in Miami. But really the issue is, is when did you buy it and when did you sell it? Or do you still hold it? And if you bought it, let's say in 2005 or six or seven, it, undoubtedly you got hurt with the same thing with commercial because a lot of that easy credit and uh, no doc credit and you know excessive lending that created a lot of the uh, sins of the past um, and exposed a lot of folks. Um, that was you know, a key piece of the problem. But if you look at it from our perspective, if you bought right and you sold right, usually you want to be buying and selling during that up cycle, you'd be OK. So let's look at what, how important land constraints are in retention of appreciation. Again, giving you like a, a regional focus or a city focus to what, where you would want to invest. So we talked about Miami went up 108% but retained 48%. So now if you go to the current day, it still is about a 4.8% retention per year. But look at an area like Dallas that doesn't have a lot of land constraints and has ring rows and ring rows upon ring rows of expansion and very easy for rezoning uh, from agricultural to residential, where Florida continues to tighten on that, but still is, is pretty uh, development friendly. Um, you can see that Dallas doesn't have a big appreciation upride. Has a very little appreciation upride. So if someone said, would you invest in Dallas on the residential side, the answer would be no. I mean, my answer would be no, because there's not that much opportunity there. So it doesn't go up much, but it doesn't go down much. But if you're looking for returns, you don't necessarily want to focus there. But if you look at a place like New York City, New York City went up 116%, but retained 63%. Cost of entry is very expensive. Landlocked, land constrained. Look at Washington, DC. A lot of that retention in DC is because of the government job creation and government spending that's happened in the last four years. If you look at a market like San Francisco, went up 119%, very similar to Manhattan, and retained 38%. But now let's look at Las Vegas. It went up 136% and not only gave it all back, but gave more of it back. If you go to Detroit, for example, it gave even more back. So um, this is hopefully, in our, from our perspective, this is part of our thesis in our investing is, is it's very important to be an active buyer and seller during the up cycle. Don't try to predict the top of the market. Don't hold out for the last dollar of profitability, but be an active seller. When the energy is coming back in, take your profits and get out. Now, where I learned that uh, was in 1995 and 1996 through uh, 98, I was heavily investing in Naples. The dot-com bubble was starting to percolate. Um, there was news that uh, you know, a lot of bad things would potentially happen. Uh, we were not getting as many phone calls as we used to get on properties that we held. Um, so I made the decision to sell everything that we owned and completely liquidate in 2000. Some of my partners, bankers, accountants said, you're crazy. You know, what are you doing? And I said, look, you know, when the phone stops ringing and you own good assets, that means they're not that desirable right now. And there's a cost of capital, so we need to sell. We sold everything. The market dipped down for two years. In 2002, there were signs of recovery. We came back in heavy, acquired big time residential hotels. Uh, commercial, retail. In 2000, 
six, the market started getting soft. I was sitting on the, the board of a bank. Um, I started selling everything in 2005 just because I was taking profits, but started accelerating that in early 2006. The market peaked in mid-2007. We saw prices starting to drop when you're aggressively trying to unload assets to not get hurt, like a lot of people did, what you need to do is always be 10 to 15% below similar properties so that you get that first look and hopefully you can move that property um, and always stay below market when a market's dropping as a seller and hopefully you had enough profit so you can get out before it keeps going and passes you by. Um, we sold our last property from that holding in June of 07 was the last property we sold and we got out. So then all this stuff that we just talked about came together and we said we need to launch a private equity fund. Residential leads commercial, let's do a residential focused fund. So we started raising capital and we raised capital, oversubscribed our first fund, went out, bought a lot of property in an area that Tim is very familiar with. We both lived not far from each other in southwest Florida, but you know, our new acquaintances now, but we know a lot of the same people. So he knows these stories uh, because he's uh, know the people that have experienced a lot of this. And this big housekeeping or sweeping, you know, knocked out some of the biggest, most prestigious, powerful players in real estate, not only in Florida, but around the country. And a lot of it had to do with debt and leverage. So one of the questions now that we get asked is, is it too late for residential, uh, to be an investor in residential? So yeah, I'm going to ask you guys, what, what do you think? Is it too late to, to be in residential when you look at that, something like that? What does that tell you? Anybody have a comment on that? Just the last 12 months of appreciation in different markets on the residential side according to Case Schiller. So Fort Myers, Florida, average home, medium home price up 41%, Naples up 20%, California as a state up 19%, Arizona up 20%. Remember I said in, uh, in, um, on air just recently the right time to buy would have been 09, 010, and 11. Because you're seeing these appreciation uprides, that means that a lot of the opportunity or the spread is now gone there's still money to be made and there's still opportunity, but just not as much because for the last two years, these types of appreciation have occurred from the unrealistic lows that were drawn down as a result of forced selling, uh, foreclosures, short sales, and, and so on. So, you know, we would contest that a lot of that opportunity on residential has come and gone. If you participated in it, you saw the greater upside. If you're getting into it now, you can still make money, but just won't be so much opportunity. The real opportunity is shifted and moved to commercial, which as we mentioned earlier, follows residential. And we'll talk about why it follows it, but one of the reasons it, it it's, has a lag is because it's income producing. So because it's income producing, the banks, even though loans can be in default, have hope that, hey, this borrower can probably still service this debt for a while, even if the rest of their portfolio is at risk. Um, but there are certain covenants, for example, and regulatory rules that tell the banks, even if a guy is performing on this one particular asset, but the rest of his portfolio, even if it's with other banks, is at risk, then you have to foreclose on them unless they can shore up that particular loan that's now probably appraising at a lower number than when we wrote the loan. So we need a, a significant principal pay down or cross collateralization that's meaningful. If we can't get that, then you're gonna have to start the process of foreclosure. So common, what you're gonna see here, and this is part of the opportunity and gives you a flavor for the timing of commercial real estate investing. As you can see, the white, hard to see, I don't know if you, can, you guys can read all that, but the blue lines are deliveries and the whites are under construction. So this is uh, Miami, for example. Um, does this have a, it does? Whoa. 
big time. Uh, the, as you can see, the peak of development, 06, 07, 08, and then everything just kind of falls off the map. If you look at the United States, that is consistent throughout the United States. And the only new, house, or new construction and commercial that's going on is owner-occupied. There's very, very little speculative building going on. And the reason for that is there's funds like ours out there buying good quality assets, sometimes less than 10 years old, for a third to half of replacement cost, which means we can lease them out for much less than someone could if they build a brand new building at today's cost of replacement. So until that inventory is stabilized and leased up, an underwriter in a bank is not going to give you that loan to do that speculative building because he's going to say you have to wait till all those buildings that TerraCap owns that are similar to what you want to build are stabilized and occupied because you can't compete with them on rents. So that's part of what's going to continue to drag and delay starts and deliveries in commercial construction. That's the period of time in our thesis that we needed to utilize to stabilize the properties with lack of competition. So in our thesis, we said we need, we buy a property at a, at a deep discount, we'll take care of deferred maintenance, we'll position for new tenants, try to bring in new tenants. We need a period of two to four years to do that. And because of the no starts and the amount of time it takes to start, and I know you guys are talking about projects of what a permit a building, then go ahead and prep the site, and then come out of the ground and have it ready, that's a two to three year process typically. So if there's no starts going on right now, and there's not enough demand for the underwriters to justify the speculative construction, it gives us the time we need to basically unfairly st stabilize the assets and then position them for resale, either individually or, or package them. And while all this is happening, you can see that the rental rates not only are stabilized, but are starting to go up, especially in areas where there's demand. So you can see they dropped and then now they're stabilized or they're starting to go up. So all that relates to you know, strong offense, buying below replacement cost in rapidly growing markets with limited future supply. I would uh, tell you that that's a, a good way to start. Look for those things that we talked about and, and make sure that some of those um, demand components are in place. Then you want to have a low basis, which you can do in today's investing environment. Um, where there's limits on new construction. Uh, it allows you to get tenants, bring them in at a lower uh, rate, and, and you'd be surprised. 50 cents to a dollar means a lot to a tenant, so you don't have to match a decrease in rents to the amount of decrease in the purchase price, not even close to it, um, especially when demand is starting to, to go back up. We use very little to no debt. So that's one of the reasons a lot of folks got in trouble was because they were too levered, or what we call in the industry, they were priced to perfection. So in the past, especially in the last five, or let's, you know, not including the recession, but four or five years prior to that, as prices of construction and properties were going up at very rapid rates, in order to return results in a private equity environment at the mid-teens to, let's say, the low to mid-20s, investors had to be priced to perfection, meaning everything had to work perfect. You had to have the right amount of debt, you had to have the right rental rates, you had to have the right occupancy, and you had to have the right exit cap. And if you didn't have all those things working together perfectly, you could be in trouble. But what happens now? If I can buy that same building, for half of what it costs to build it, how much debt, if any, do I need to replace that leverage that was there before? My low basis may have replaced the lion's share of that leverage that I needed to be priced to perfection, which is the only piece that gives pause to investors is leverage and debt in the real estate world. So 
um, where there's no debt, there's no maturity risk, we keep cash reserves, and uh, you know, we position for the recovery. Now I'm going to give you some real world examples of transactions that we've done in our second fund to give you a flavor for how uh, amazing and exciting a time it is to be a buyer. It's not so exciting to be a seller, but it's really fun to be a buyer. Thomas and I spent some time together. You guys really missed out on a fantastic conversation. No, I'm just kidding. We, we had a good conversation. Um, so let's look at this building. This building is across the street from, and Tim's been our building, across the street from a brand new Simon uh, Mall, which is a 1.2 million square foot mall. It's only been open about three years. It's very successful, very well received, was erected in the middle of the recession, opened in the middle of the recession, and only six miles away from another competing mall, also 1.2 million square feet, opening within six months of each other. Anyone would think, wow, you're in the middle of a recession, there's two malls opening five miles apart from each other, a combined two and a half million square feet of retail space what a formula for disaster, right? They're both wildly successful. And why are they wildly successful? Because of the importance of understanding population, tracking the population growth, and recognizing that this area was underserved with this type of product, these malls, outdoor activity centers, walking center uh, type malls with some mixed use um, residential um, and retail blended. So this is right across the street from it. So um, we bought this property in July of 2012. It's 11,000 square feet. The previous cost of the land was $850,000, which was paid by the previous owner in 2003. His basis was $2.2 million, or $200 a square foot, all in. We bought the building and the land for less than what he paid for the land. This is what it looked like. Fast forward 60 days. We changed the color scheme to match the new Simon Mall so that we could create what we call a halo effect, a halo effect or piggyback off of their theme or their concept, make people think that it's part of, of the mall DRI, development of regional impact. The, um, uh, property used to be called the Walden uh, Office Center. We changed the name to Coconut Office Center to further piggyback off of this big, fantastic, successful mall. When we bought it, the occupancy was 0%. Five months later, the occupancy is 64%. We've just got a lease out 2,200 square feet of the first floor. And uh, we actually moved our offices to the top floor. Um, Downing Fry Realty uh, took the second floor and this front section of the first floor. And then we anticipate by probably um, April or May, it'll be 100% occupied. So again, you know, some key components here. Replacement cost in today's world is about 2.75 million. We paid 840, we put 90,000 into it. We're into it for $930,000. Implied value at an eight cap is 1.6 million. Equity multiplier about 1.9. This acquisition here, um, and I've got to explain to you guys a little bit these numbers, so you know don't don't freak out on me. You know when I tell you the certain numbers that conflict with these, you'll understand and you follow me because we, we try to translate it. To, I was at University of Florida earlier, and um, I have to um, share with them numbers that are consistent with what we bought here. So that's why you'll see there's a bit of a conflict, but it's not really a conflict once you understand. Well, that was wordy, huh? So, so this is an apartment complex that was built in 1999, finished in 2000. Total 286 units, okay? It was originally built as an apartment complex. These are covered parking. This is, you know, buildings. Uh, so on. Um, it's in Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, if you understand Cape Coral, Florida, parts of the state where there was tremendous amount of single lot platting development going on, 
Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, developers would take big tracts of land. They did this in Marco Island. They did this in Golden Gate, Naples. They did this in Lehigh Acres, and they did this in Cape Coral. They did this in Northport. And so the development style du jour back then was buy a big piece of land, subdivide it in as many bite-sized residential lots as you can. But they didn't think about things like multifamily, the demand for commercial when completely built out. So they were platted a way that creates opportunities if you understand uh, the situation. And that, my point behind all this is Cape Coral was, is dramatically underserved for multifamily. So there's not a lot of rental competition there. Matter of fact, this is the only apartment complex of more than 30 units in all of Cape Coral, which at build out will be home to 450,000 people. So you can compare that to what's going on here in Gainesville, and you go, wow, um, maybe three times Gainesville with one apartment complex? Sounds like an interesting acquisition, right? And maybe you could have some long-term consistent, sustained demand for that property. So 286 units was built from scratch, rented out. There was a big movement, in, uh, and the guy paid. Uh, the original uh, developer sold it in 2005, but he sold all 286 units, not 196 units, but 286 units for $28.8 million, or 100,000 a unit. Translates to about $100 a square foot, because that there are roughly 1,000 square feet per unit. Now, two bedrooms are 1,000, three bedrooms, uh, 1,100 square feet. In 06, he tried to convert it to condominiums and was successful in doing that. But while he was converting it to condominiums in 2006, he had to vacate rentals in order to sell fee simple ownership in these condominiums. So that's a, a, a little risky business, uh, especially if things slow up. So at the peak, he sold, in, in short order, and it was quite successful, in short order sold about 86, 85 units, whatever the difference between 196 and 286 is, um, basically 90 units, sold 90 units in a period of 12 months. At the peak, they were going for 220,000 a unit. Things started to collapse, sales started to slow. They went from 220,000 a unit to 180,000 a unit, 120,000 a unit, 80,000 a unit, no rental income. The debt was with Gramercy, uh, which is a mortgage REIT. Um, he had financed uh, the acquisition through them, couldn't service his debt, had other properties that, that um, fell apart as well. Um, so Gramercy took the property back through foreclosure. Um, they were in ownership of the property, found an apartment rental company to manage it. Um, but uh, Gramercy's in New York, didn't really have their eyes on what was going on there. Um, we knew uh, the asset manager at Gramercy, this was an off-market transaction, it wasn't for sale. And we ended up, they marked it on their books at 13.5 million. We bought it for 8.13 million or $41,000 a unit. Um, replacement cost is estimated to be about $22 million and it's 98% occupied. And it was, the irony of all this is it was 98% occupied when we bought it. Implied value at 85,000 unit is 6.6 .6 million. Right now, the market supports 80,000 a unit. The market's rising, we'll probably be patient. You can see we just closed on it December 27th. Um, but uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the crazy stuff that goes on, for seven years, seven units stayed out of service at basically 1,000 a month per unit, 70,000 a month, <laughs> you know, almost 100,000 a year in revenue. And we took five of those seven that needed very little changes, and in, in like three weeks, they're back in service. So that's a, another opportunity there. Um, one thing I think is important to, to know, uh, we bought this with a joint venture partner. I don't know uh, if you've heard about a lot of what's going on right now is there's a lot of money wanting to be in commercial real estate 
from big funds or high net worth, super high net worth, uh, billionaire type uh, folks that want to participate in markets that have the, the demographics and information that we're talking about here but don't have offices there. So they look for local operators that they can trust, that they can partner with. They uh, partnered with us because their offices are not close to Florida and they said we'd like to participate in some of these off-market transactions with you. So they, you put together these relationships where in order to allow them to participate, you have what's called profit sharing or promote structures. So in this example, they put up 80% of the equity, we put up 20%. Up to a 10% return, it's pro rata per pursu, meaning equal, everybody takes their equal share of profits. From 10 to 15% return, we get 30% of their profits on 80% of the equity. From 15 to 20% return, we get, in return for letting them to participate, from 15 to 20% returns, or IRRs to them, we get 40% of their profits on 80% of the equity. From a 20% IRR or better, we get 50% of their profits on 80% of the equity. So these are the types of deals that are common in private equity right now where outside money wants to get into certain markets but they don't have the boots on the ground or the relationships or the access to these types of transactions. So they're willing to give you these promotes or profit shares in order to participate. This here uh, is a perfect example of a classic textbook private equity deal that will eventually be true arbitrage. Tim, I know you know this area. This is um, Southwest Florida Regional, or, uh, well now Southwest Florida International. When I grew up it was regional. Um, I'm from the Naples Marco Island area so uh, this used to be an uh, amusing little landing strip back when I grew up but now it's, it's uh, Southwest Florida International Airport services the Fort Myers, Southwest Florida area. It takes in about uh, just under 8 million passengers uh, a year. Um, it's in Lee County, for those of you who aren't familiar, right by Fort Myers, Cape Coral, Bonita Springs, Estero, which is home to about 750, 780,000 total people. Um, also predominantly services Collier County, which is about another 360,000 people. So the combined two counties are about a million. This right here is an office park, light industrial. So this is looking south and this is looking north from the airport. It is, this is the brand new uh, JetBlue Boston Red Sox training facility uh, where they have their brand new stadium opened less than a year ago. It'll be a year at the end of, this, uh, the end of February that they've been in here. Um, and it's directly adjacent to this office park. So this group of buildings was built by an organization, um, very reputable in the area at the time, uh, had a total of about 15, I'm sorry, 50 buildings, some class A office, some light industrial, and so on across the board. Uh, and this organization um, was over levered, had well over $150 million in total debt. When occupancies fell, um, like many others, uh, they had levered up the property, taken some equity out, and when occupancy fell, didn't have the cash flow to service the debt, everything started to fall apart. They gave the properties back to uh, LNR, not LNR, LNR. LNR uh, is a servicer slash owner of uh, of notes that uh, were granted to them through workout relationship or agreement with the federal government. Um, they were granted access to do workouts and, and uh, disposition of as much as $900 million worth of, uh, of assets or loans, um, which would translate into you know, almost overall $2, um, uh, $2 billion worth of uh, um, total assets. This particular situation, we made an offer to them at one time to LNR, the special servicer, for $8 million. And 
it never went anywhere. It's 25 acres, seven buildings, a combined 230,000 square feet. Suddenly, they decide to take it to auction. So it goes to auction.com. Some of you have heard of auction.com, right? Sounds kind of silly to buy something in an auction, right? You know, it's public, it's online, you know, it sounds silly. You had access to an off-market deal, and now you're bidding against the public. But our position was we had already done all of this due diligence on this asset. We already knew we wanted to buy it. We couldn't buy it direct. Now it's on auction, and the auction's in 60 days. So those, the public doesn't really have the time to come here if they don't know the, that it's for sale, to come down, do their detailed due diligence, get their machine going, and get comfortable with the area. Uh, and we already were. So we ended up buying it for $7.2 million, or $31 a square foot. Re estimated replacement cost of the structures is 15.5 million, does not include the 21 acres that would come with that, which would bring that up to over $20 million in total replacement cost. So when we acquired the note, right, um, the builder or developer who was in default uh, of all these uh, still had their guarantees in place, and they were also still operating and managing the property. So we went to them proactively when we were first trying to buy it before it went to auction, and we said, let's work together and see if we can stabilize this asset. We're going to try to buy it. And um, if we buy it, then we'll allow you to buy back in, potentially, uh, for a percent ownership. But the way to earn that right is to show us what you can do um, while this pro these problems are going on. So they ended up helping. Uh, take the occupancy in five months from 55% to 82%. And this is now signed 84%. All credit tenants, uh, companies like Home Depot, Nestle, uh, Red Bull, um, uh, Neogenomics, uh, you know, big, big companies. Um, so in a period of five months, it went from 55% occupancy to 84% occupancy. Gross revenue went up. Um, $370,000. The value uh, at 95% at an eight cap is about 15 million or roughly a double. We're only 10% away from that. We didn't perform that we would get to 80% or actually not even to 75% occupancy for two years and we got there in five months. And that's a phenomena that we're referring to as shadow tenancy. And what is shadow tenancy? It's when tenants who are interested, because there's a lot of businesses that didn't get hurt during the recession and have grown and need places to expand to, or are already here in this park and have grown and wanted to expand. <clears throat> Those particular tenants were interested in going into this park, but when they knew it was in foreclosure or ownership was uncertain, they weren't willing to sign a lease. And their leasing broker or agent advised them, don't sign a lease. You want to only sign a lease when you know Who's going to buy it? Will they take care of deferred maintenance? Will they be in a position to fund tenant improvements? All those things. So once we acquired the note and met with all the tenants, the word got out in a short period of time, which helped with the leasing, which got it to a very viable uh, property. And now we actually have lenders. We paid all cash, but the lenders are saying to us, we'll lend you between 16 and 17 million dollars on that asset. We won't do that, but that's the type of environment it is. So, um, so we said to the, uh, the original developers and property managers that if they helped us, which they did, then we would release them of their guarantees and do a, de a friendly deed in lieu of foreclosure. The guarantees they had were up to $11 million because that's the note we bought for 7.2 was had a value of 11 million with late charges and, and uh, so on. So we bought a note for 11 million for 7.2, converted it through deed in lieu of foreclosure, and doubled the value of, of our capital in a period of five months. This is a, a hotel that we acquired, 120 rooms, Hampton Inn and Suites, Fort Myers Beach is the town, but it's technically two miles from the beach of Fort Myers and two miles from uh, Sanibel. 
The previous owner paid $10.4 million for it, or just under $90,000 a room. We bought it for $4.3 million, or $36,000 a room. We will renovate it and put in $1.2 million uh, over the summer to be consistent with the flag. Every five to seven years, hotels are required to do a PIP, property improvement plan. Um, but the property is fantastic. We've had, uh, since when we, when we bought it, it was being managed by a group out of Dallas. Uh, we weren't comfortable um, with uh, their scores on the um, SALT reports. Uh, and we weren't comfortable with their lack of progress since they owned the asset for a year, so we let them go. Interviewed a bunch of other hotel management groups, found a local group we liked. Since our ownership, just of one month or so, a couple months, if we look at December 2011 versus December 2012, a year-over-year -year increase in occupancy through the month is up 43.7%. We've, of course, had certain nights and weekends that were 100%, but this is the average, so up 43% year-over-year occupancy. Uh, revenue per room, 38.7%. Uh, so our total cost will be $5.5 million. Replacement cost is 14.4 right now, about 120,000 a room. Stabilized value, conservatively, is about 10 million. Uh, implied equity multiplier of 1.8. And that's the presentation. So I'd like to open it up now for any questions or comments. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have. I, I may have exceeded that. Uh, but um, I'm certainly open to um, answer anything you may have. Yes? How big is your acquisition team? Our acquisition team is three people. We, we're, we would be considered uh, in the industry an emerging manager. And an emerging manager in private equity means uh, somewhere between 100 million and 500 million in assets under management. Um, that's the, the space we would be considered. So we're not, you know, it's only our second fund. Start our first fund in 2008, thank God. So we have no legacy product. No bad vintage years. It's just like a clean start. Um, but you know, we'll be adding to that over as we grow, up, as we get more investors, institutional or high net worth, you know, pension plans, endowments, what have you. Um, we scale the team as we go. Is the, hang on, so there's a gentleman back there. Have a question. You know, I grew up in that area, right? So um, I've watched, and Tim been there, watched a lot of, a lot of movement there. The lion's share is, uh, without a doubt, elderly, okay? Elderly, meaning, let's say, uh, it used to be between like 60 and 80 was kind of the average. Those averages are moving down now, where I'd say the average is now 50 to 80. Um, and I know that uh, in some parts, between Sarasota all the way down, depending on the city, because we do you know, a lot of demographic studies and just reviews of, of the, the changes, but some of them are averaging like 48 uh, years old is kind of the average in some cities. And some cities, like in Naples, the average would be higher. It'd probably be closer to 58. It's probably the average. Um, Regardless, the, the trend clearly is it's getting younger. That has to do with mobility um, of the workforce, um, automation, communication, makes it easy to you know, work in your, you know, your bathing suit and flip-flops on your, in your, you know, with your iPad you know, in, your, in your balcony or at the pool. Um, and we see a lot of that. So it's just a trend, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, that, it, it, you have to, I have to further explain the, rest, the limitations that come as a result of massive single lot platting. What happened is in the 60s and 70s, um, the Rosen brothers, for example, acquired that land, put in some canal systems and you know some lake systems. Actually, has I think more canal systems than any other place in the state. Cape Coral does, um, but 90% of it is single lot platted for residential. The problem is, is they sold all the lots to somebody, right? Some of them have built homes on them, sprinkled here and there. Some more densely populated in the south, southwest portion. Where they, call it the uh, yacht club area. And it thins out as you go up. But the bottom line is, is they've all traded hands. So to assemble a meaningful track of land to duplicate 25 acres, right? And the, the average lots there were um, an eighth of an acre. So you, you know, that it was, it was an amusing thing because when they platted it back then, they platted it to be, there were 40 foot fronts and 100 foot deep. They platted it for trailers, for you know, tr you know, trailer park or you know whatever you want to call it. And then they realized that the demand was more for single family residential, so they started selling them in pairs and twos. So when you buy a lot right now, if you go to Cape Coral and say you know I want to buy a lot because the minimum to build a single family is 10,000 square feet, or two of these lots as they platted them. So you gotta buy two side by side, and some people have three, they call it a triple lot, but the typical uh, residential lot sale in Cape Coral is two 40-foot fronts at 100 foot deep directly next to each other, creating a quarter acre lot. So if you think about that, you to assemble that, right, where in some cases they're quarter acre lots, that's four times 25, Right, You'll, you need to get 100 people to agree to sell to you. And then you got to hope that you find a track of land where there's no houses in the middle because a few of those houses sprinkled in there. Now, all of a sudden, it's not reasonable for acquisition because that house may be worth two or 300,000 and blows your whole model. That's the part that I didn't explain. If you'd heard that, you probably would have, wouldn't have asked that. Now you know. You're like, now you can. Oh, okay. So you know. So did I tell the truth? Right. Yeah. Okay. But so that's off a of four-mile cove by Veterans. So it's just off of Del Prado, just north of, of Veterans, slightly to the east of Del Prado behind that wall. There's a Walmart there that's adjacent to it. You probably know the area. But that's why that was a very compelling acquisition, because we knew that a lot of the owners that had homes that came and lost their job or you know, had challenges through the recession, a lot of owners became renters. But there wasn't a lot of competing rental product. And so when we saw this, it was like, you know, unless other people really know Cape Coral and recognize that they can't just go buy 25 acres and build a competing property, and you wouldn't know that unless you lived there. Or I told you, right? You wouldn't know how it was set up. But most people would think, oh, we just, you know, wh why is that so attractive? They would say, that's not a, that great of a deal. I mean, it's a great deal, right? I mean, we've already, you know, the units are selling for twice what we paid right now. But most people would say, you know, you can just build one there, you know. It's, they don't have that something that special, you know, with that acquisition. And the guys even in New York, who were the mortgage reader, took it back, didn't understand that. So when I walked it with our JV partners, you know, very smart business people, and you know, all the light bulbs are going off, and like, are you serious? And I, I said, yeah. And they're like, let's, let's do it, let's buy it. Yes? Uh, in regards to the uh, Naples, Collier County area, uh -huh. um, it looks like the development is west of 70 miles, right? Most of it. Most of it, there's a lot now happening east of 75. We just sold a track of land on Collier Boulevard, 951, which is east. There's a lot of it going east out of Mockley and Vanderbilt Extension. Uh -huh. um, but it, it, it pushes up against what's referred to the sending and receiving lands that abut the Everglades. 
So there are some real restrictions there. Okay. Where in Naples? You can be real specific. I went to high school there. So. Yeah. There, you know, between Twin Eagles, like yeah. down in Mockley, um, Centerline just bought a big track of land uh, east of 951, uh, about 120 acres. We, we bid on it. Wachovia had it. They wouldn't take my price for it. Went to auction, Centerline, got it. They're going to build about, I think, 400 units residential there. Between there and Twin Eagles, um, and then you've got the quarry, right? Um, and oh, it's at Old Cypress, is that right? Um, you know, people are going to, the only place to go, the problem with Collier County, like I said, it's 67% preservation land. So there's only about, if you talk to whether it's the Luckerts or us or the Colliers, there's about 12 to 15 years left of residentially entitled land or with future land use of residential. There's only 12 to 15 years left of development, and then it's gone, unless they push into the sending and receiving lands. Um, south of there, as you know, is Golden Gate Estates area. It has the same situation we just talked about, single lot platted. But, but the lots are much larger. They are. You know, it varies from, you know, from organization to organization and lender to lender. Some of them, I could tell you, early on, we were, I was buying notes in 2009 when a lot of people, you know, you know hadn't really gotten into it yet. And um, the banks were so used to lending that they didn't have asset liquidation departments in 08 and 09. So they were trying to find themselves and put together systems and figure out what they could and couldn't do. Um, so sometimes it took a little longer back then than it does now. But again, it depends on the bureaucracy and complexity of the entity. We have done note acquisitions um, from beginning to end. You're familiar with Busey Bank. There's some Busey Bank uh, branches in Fort Myers area, for example. We bought three notes from them. And those took two weeks. I mean, it's a, it's a contract. You're buying a note. You've got to do the due diligence and understand the, you know, get, make sure you, you understand what you're buying. But if you've got a good legal team, you can do it fast. I mean, you can do it in a week. Yeah, I, we're, I'm actually building in Tiburon right now. Uh -huh. And the bank just kept it for years and just wouldn't sell the note at any point, at face value, discount, or anything. Mm -hmm. And they finally sold it, but it went on their books for like four or five Yeah, years. that's the whole extend and pretend, which is prolong the release of a lot of commercial assets into the market. So there were funds that wanted to do, private equity funds that wanted to do commercial acquisitions in distressed situations, and they tried to launch in 2000. Uh, nine, 2010, um, and even some in er, uh, you know, early 2011, and they were too early because private equity funds, this is taking a little bit aside, but I'm going to come back to this. Private equity funds usually have uh, what's called a, a, a preferred return or a pref rate, a cost of capital. So an investor gives you money. You say, okay, you've got a compounding preferred return of 8%, 10% on your capital that we invest for you. What happened was is if there were income producing properties or an asset that other than land, banks initially said this recession is not going to last this long. This value, this asset's got more value. We're not going to give it away to guys like me 
right? That we're not going to give it away. We're not going to take these low ball offers. And the regulators, remember I sat on the board of the bank, so the regulators were saying, you can do developer workout agreements, forbearance agreements, modify some of the terms and conditions, but none of these vehicles that they were letting them do had more than like two years life to them. But sometimes they would delay even the start of the process. And then the last resort is foreclosure when they start going down the foreclosure process. So a lot of it just has to do with the internal management and boards perspective on that asset. I know it's called Galleria, Vanderbilt Galleria. I know the assets right across from Tiburon. Yeah, it is. Um, and actually, uh, I tried to buy it after that guy bought it. Yeah, yeah, he won't. Yeah, so it just varies. And, and, and I'm glad you brought it up because the bigger the organization and the more strength they had financially, like Wells Fargo, right? who took over Wachovia, they're extremely difficult. And in that property that I talked about that Centerline bought, that's who had that note. They absorbed it from Wachovia when Wachovia failed. Wells Fargo is very sound financially, so you know, they, their loan loss reserve ratio is never at risk because they're so big. But if you're a small community bank or a small regional bank that has a smaller loan loss reserve and is under strict scrutiny and observ you know, uh, surveillance of, of the regulators, um, you have to move the assets quicker because they're coming in every quarter saying, you know, you're upside down, you've got, you, you, know, you don't have enough shareholder equity to move into your loan loss reserves, your bank's overall at risk, your, your ratios are out of whack and you need to fix it. So, so they're more motivated if, if they can. They're either going to fail uh, and go away, or they want to, if they have the ability to cover the loss, then they'll take it and move on. There was a 1% in, uh, in the business that failed that year. Yeah, Orion. Yeah, a mm -hmm. yeah, good friend of mine invested like $1 million in Orion, was, uh, lost it all. And uh, we've bought assets from Iberia, um, who, and those assets were Orion assets that we bought. So um, Mike, uh, um, Mark Collier, not of the Collier family, uh, is the head of REO for that group. Very good guy. Mm -hmm. How much uh, distress do you think is still in the I think there's about two more years of buying at these types of deals. And then I think, for the most part, it's going to be over. The retail is lagging right now. Um, so we have not bought any retail, for example. We would buy what's called shadow retail, meaning retail that's piggybacks off of a major box, but a, a, a box limited, you know, not like a best buy is the box. The, the box would be um, Walmart, Super Target, something like that. Small retail center that shares that entry or parking lot you know, feeds, so what's the, what's the parasite that hooks onto fish? What are they called? The, yeah. We, we, that, that's a perfect center right now and the only center that we would buy, um, especially in an area like we just talked about. You put two brand new, fantastic malls that are wildly successful and you hear this large sucking sound of all of those tenants being sucked out of the local strip centers going to that mall because it's a destination shopping place and you know they so we in, until until there's more people that come and smaller services that will ultimately go into those retail centers you know we wouldn't be a buyer unless it's shadow yes so um, after that pipeline was through two years what's your plans yeah <laughs> thomas asked me that um, we, you know, we're going to do a series of private equity funds. Um, we're not 100% sure yet, and we get asked this because what happens is, is when you start getting into institutional uh, investor relationships or endowment relationships, for example, like the university uh, that invests with us, they want a long-term relationship with managers uh, so that if they take profits, they can put them into the next vehicle. Um, so we get that question a lot. Um, we are not 100% sure, but these are the areas that we would consider that, in my opinion, seem interesting. 
opportunistic, which is what this is, and what residential development site plays are, where the returns can be between 20 to 45% a year, which is what we're seeing on our, on our exits. Um, that's going to last about two more years as far as a flow, you know, a flow of that type of opportunity. And there's a couple reasons why, because as we exit stuff that we bought at a higher sale price, that now goes into the sales comps, that goes into the appraisals, that the banks have to do every year on assets that they've owned. Those values are going to be perceived to be going up, which puts, you know, creates spread compression on the opportunity for us. And now you can't get 25 to 35, 40% returns. You're going to end up getting maybe more like 10 to 15% returns in a couple years from now. Um, and so not that that's bad, but it's, you know, not, you know, deep, deep value opportunistic investing. I think that, um, back to your, your question, um, we would do an open-ended core fund, uh, which is a very safe, um, you know, class A office space in good locations, but yields six to eight, maximum 10% consistently. Uh, we would do something like that. We would also be interested in international agriculture um, on a private, uh, side, we own some um, orange groves and uh, cattle land. So, you know, we're, we're familiar with ag. Um, I was telling uh, Thomas that I think uh, timber uh, and timber funds is a good play right now as residential recovers. 70% of all um, construction materials in residential come from timber, so, or some flavor of timber, right? So you're going to see an increased, uh, you know, value of timber funds, and they, they yield pretty good even in average years. I mean, they yield, you know, 12 to 16 percent pretty consistently. So when slow times, they go no lower than eight. That's what we'd look at. And then one other thing, and we talked about this, and that is, and this is back to your comment, we would do a special situations fund where capital is only called upon for special acquisitions where there's going to be two years is like the big spread opportunity but there's you know another 500 billion behind that that is either going to get refinanced depending on the strength of the bank and the borrowers or it's going to be released over time but just not as frequently. And so we would uh, have a special uh, situations fund that's real estate oriented where we basically patiently wait for off-market cherry pick deals that are really sweet. Now, instead of charging 20, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. To your point, yeah, but a lot less than what we thought. I mean, perfect example. If you and Tim knows, if you go just south of our building, there's another three-story building that Bank of America took. It's for sale. It's only 1,000 square feet bigger than ours. Nicer finishes, definitely Class A finishes. Ours is like a B, B plus, right? They're asking 3.1 million dollars for that building. Remember, we paid 840, right? <laughs> like. You know, I could throw a rock and hit the building. They want, at that price, at their, at their sale price, they want right now 1450 a square foot, triple net, right? You know, net 1450 We We did our first year with five-year, you know, five-year, you know, escalators at 1350 Only a dollar off. They're like, oh, TI? I mean, we didn't have to do much. Fortunately, with the tenant that moved in, they will have to do more because their finishes are so nice. You know, we're <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I think so. 
Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, do, you want to do shorter leases, right? So, so you can negotiate when the market resets. So you do two to four year leases instead of five to 10 year leases. You know, brokers like you to do 10 year leases so you get a bigger commission, right? You got to know what drives them and know what the opportunity is for you. So, but I, you know, we, we do two to four year leases um, depending on the situation. Well, it is condo converted, so it could be sold as individual condos today, okay. completely. And our we, our strategy is to, and I'll tell you how we did our perform on our modeling. If we sold 12 months from acquisition, which was December 27th, if we sold one third of the 196 units at 70,000 a unit, and then the next 12 months sold the second third at 80,000 a unit and then the last third at 85,000 a unit, again, all below replacement cost. Replacement's 100,000 a unit, okay? We would do a 33% IRR to the investors. So that's probably what we're gonna do. Now, the other thing that's happening is there's a bit of a frenzy going on with internet, European buyers and Latin American buyers wanting to buy affordable um, condos or rental properties in the United States, whether it's Miami or, you know, Miami's already getting bid up you know, I mean, three years ago, Miami had 22,500 condos for sale, and now they have like 4,000 condos for sale, largely bought in bulk by Brazilians. I'll give you a feel, uh, the Brazilian visas went up 40% um, in one year, <laughs> and it's like all investors coming, and uh, 400,000 visas just last year alone from Brazil and like probably never went further than the city limits of Miami right when they came to America, you know, like, so they, they know the value, yes. You know, I, I get a lot of calls because we have uh, assisted living facility um, and senior housing sites, development sites. One of them is actually on the Coconut Point Mall DRI, which is right across the street. This property is right across the street from a 35-acre parcel that Lee Memorial Hospital owns. So it's like wheelchair distance, right, to the future hospital. <laughs> so it's a good site. Um, we get calls a lot lately from groups that are doing that. Um, seems to be, in my opinion, a very good business model. The key, most of them right now are trying to buy uh, hotels that have larger rooms like inns and suites, um, types of things like the one we just showed. They're trying to buy those at a deep discount where they're older, you know, and, and tired, uh, and then convert them to assisted living or senior living. Um, and that model financially is more viable for them than buying the land and building it from scratch, of course, right? Because the cost of construction. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing that I've learned through a lot of this is because we've, we've done a lot of models, right, against these acquisitions. And it's hard to understand how with confidence or long-term confidence someone can build a building today at today's construction costs and make the business work without significant amounts of leverage or debt, which is a little, a little concerning. Um, so what that means as an investor is I would continue to, especially in primary markets, so I would continue to focus on secondary and tertiary markets that have the sustained population growth. I think that's where the most opportunity is. And if I was looking at real estate as a way to uh, become financially independent, whether it's as an investor or a broker or what have you, those are the markets that I would want to go into and control um, 
because I think that's where the most opportunity is. And of course, if you're a big building broker in New York and you're, you know, very successful, but that's very, com com it's very competitive. You know, there's guys that have been there, their families control all the relationships, and it's tough. Any other? Yes. Um, part, part of it is, I, I, I alluded to it earlier, this shadow, shadow occupancies or shadow tenancies, what I'm calling it. You know, a lot of people use that term, shadow inventory for residential. But, so I couldn't, I didn't have a term for it. So I said, maybe we'll call, it, we'll call it shadow tenancy. And, part, you know, we, you have to give credit to the fact that there has been limited new supply, right? You have to give... Uh, credit to we're in a rising environment now. So there's a recovery environment. People are feeling better and more secure about taking that step um, in, into expanding or, or starting a new business. Um, so part of that's rising tide. The other part of it is, is that when these buildings that are in desirable locations and, and good buildings were locked up in foreclosure or in default, Bar, uh, tenants that were interested in them were not willing to move in until they understood, you know, what the ownership landscape was going to be like and who the landlord was going to be. Because most cases, when a bank owns it or a third-party servicer, they put minimal to no money into maintenance. So you have all this divert, deferred maintenance that builds up. They're not responsive to the tenant's needs usually, which stress the tenants and lowers the occupancy. So a lot of people may say, hey, we want to to move into that, that West Links office park, or we're already in there, we want to expand, but who do we sign a lease with? The borrower who's in default, or the bank, or who's going to be the new owner? Is it going to be another, you know, maybe it's just going to be an organization that's going to buy it and flip it, and we don't know. But once they get comfortable with whoever the owner is, um, then they come forward. And the, the, the comfort revolves around making sure that um, the deferred maintenance is going to be taken care of, and you show that right away by getting in there and just cleaning up everything and painting. And, you know, they see it, they feel it. The buzz gets out there with the brokers and the broker community. Hey, there's a new owner, Terracap bought this. Um, they're investing money in it. Um, makes sense, you know, now, you know, to talk to them about that lease or expansion. That's really what I attribute it to is, you know, confidence in future ownership and a reluctance to move forward when the ownership is in question. Thank you very much. You're, you're welcome.